Welcome everyone. My name is Hannah Fraser and I'm the entomologist for horticulture with OMAFRA. I work out of the Guelph office if you do need to reach me and I will be providing my contact information at the end of the presentation today. This is a pre-recorded presentation and it is part of a series that we have designed for crop scouts that are working in field tomatoes and peppers. Most of the information in this presentation can be found on the OMAFRA website. Check out Crop IPM if you want more details on any of the insects that I discussed today. There are a few pests that I'm covering today that are not yet on the website, and there are others mentioned on the website that I won't cover here in much detail. Pepper weevil, a problematic community level pest that attacks peppers in the field and in the greenhouse, will be covered in a separate presentation. One of the most important aspects of crop IPM scouting is being prepared. You'll need to understand the biology and phenology of the insects and diseases you are monitoring for. In terms of insects, their seasonal biology can often be defined through periods of, or windows of activity. Some pests are problematic early in the season, others will show up later, and some are present sporadically. Using a chart like the one provided here and on our IPM website will provide you with the information that you need to prepare to meet these insects in the field. I'm going to start with a few insects that we typically see early in the season, black cutworm, Colorado potato beetle, and wireworms. The rest will follow somewhat randomly. For this presentation, some pests are problematic in either tomatoes or peppers or both. There are multiple species of early cutworms that can attack pepper and tomato transplants. These include the black cutworm, dark-sided cutworm, and the sandhill cutworm. For those of you who have participated in the introductory entomology for scout training, you might remember me mentioning black cutworm. This insect does not overwinter in Ontario, but in the Gulf Coast. It moves up here on wind currents, and the arrival can be somewhat unpredictable. Species of cutworm that overwinter here or elsewhere do so as different life stages, including eggs, larvae, pupae, or adults, depending on the species. Cutworms have a wide host range, including many vegetable crops. Female moths will lay their eggs on a number of plant species, with a preference for winter annual broadleaf weeds such as chickweed and various members of the mustard fam family, among others. In the springtime, they choose dense vegetation and weedy areas where soil moisture is high, in, and in terms of injury, it's usually at the crop borders. The eggs are small, spherical, and laid in clusters, and the females can lay up to 1,900 eggs in their lifetime. These are some of the cutworm species that you might encounter this summer. Many of the cutworms hide during the day. When disturbed, like the one in this photo on the right, they will curl up. Cutworms are often described as having a greasy appearance, but this is not true for all species. Worth noting is that the different species have different feeding habits. There are above ground climbers, soil surface and below ground feeders. So scouting requires being aware of the different types and looking for various clues. Sometimes the feeding habits change as the larvae mature from early instar onwards. If you are looking for a useful guide to cutworms, check out this free publication developed by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. It focuses on prairie species, but many of these are also common here. In it, you will find characteristics that will help you identify the cutworms. It's got some really great pictures to help you along. Black cutworm moths are fairly large with a wingspan of three to five centimeters. When I mention wingspan, this refers to the wings when open. When the wings are closed, like the picture above on the left, two thirds of the wings are so dark that they appear black. A key feature to look for are the dagger shaped markings on the back third of the wings, and I have circled those here for your reference. The black cutworm name reflects one of the key features of the larvae, their dark coloration. Their body is relatively smooth with a greasy sheen to them. They have a pale band all along the body that you can see on the picture on the right. Black cutworm can be distinguished from other species by the unequally sized paired dark spots or tubercles on the upper edges of each body segment. The front tubercle is noticeably smaller than the rear one, and you can see this, this in both, the, 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 both of the pictures that I have here. The head has two black stripes. The larvae have three pairs of true legs and four sets of fleshy abdominal prolegs. The larvae will feed at night, at or just below the soil line, and they will cut the seedlings close, close to the base. During the day, they seek shelter by hiding in the soil or under the crop residue. Larger larvae may clip off plants at the base and pull them underground to feed in peace. 
Much of the risk from black cutworm is associated with young transplants and damage is observed in the spring. It can be sporadic. Look for small plants that have been clipped at the soil level, often in patches. Cutworm moths are attracted to weeds, especially winter annuals, where they will lay their eggs. If fields like this are disked and planted to tomatoes, young larvae will move onto plants. Cutworm damage occurs in patches within a field. Areas of visible damage have already been attacked and cutworm larvae will be moving away into adjacent areas onto new plants. Spraying an entire field is usually unnecessary, so take note of affected areas. Focus your scouting on field edges which border natural vegetation and weedy or low damp areas. If cutworm damage is suspected, confirm presence of larvae by screening the soil under and around the injured plants or checking under plants and plant debris. Because the larvae are nocturnal, scouting at night or dawn is suggested, but it may not be practical. Larvae are most easily controlled when they are small. So when do you need to start your scouting efforts? Well, right after transplantation. Newly germinated seedlings and small plants are most at risk as cutworms can cut off and kill the entire plant. As the plants get larger, cutworms may only nip off a leaf, leaving the plant to survive and continue to grow, so it really is an early season risk. Start monitoring fields in the spring when conditions begin warming up. Take note of the size of the larvae. Newly hatched larvae are really, really tiny and they will actively feed until they reach up to about two and a half centimeters. Once the larvae mature and are generally larger, they tend to be mostly done their feeding as they prepare to pupate. Want to know if the cutworm is actively feeding? Well, you can check the gut contents to see. And by doing so, if you're seeing a lot of greenish frass, it means that they are still actively uh, feeding. Colorado potato beetle are from the family Chrysomelidae or leaf beetles. This is a family that is associated with a significant um, number of pests in agricultural crops. Both the adults and the larvae actively feed on the foliage of host plants. They are active early in the season all the way through harvest. The adults are about a centimeter in size and they are yellow to orange with 10 black stripes on their elytra, which as you will remember are the hardened forewings. The larvae, and there are four instars, are a reddish-orange colour with two rows of black spots along their sides. The yellow egg masses can be observed from mid-June onwards and they are found on the underside of leaves. Usually these egg masses have 25 to 40 eggs each. They will turn orange just prior to hatching. There are two to three generations per year. The Colorado potato beetle overwinters adults in the soil in areas previously planted with Solanaceae host plants, which include potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplant, or weedy areas with wild hosts like nightshades. Most of these will walk into nearby fields into the, in the springtime. The adults and the larvae feed on the foliage, and the type of injury you will see is chewed or and irregular holes on the leaves or occasionally on the stems. Sometimes they can actually take a plant all the way down to the soil if numbers are high. The young transplants are especially susceptible to defoliation. They may also occasionally feed on the green fruit. You need to start scouting for Colorado potato beetle right after transplant. The migration of the overwintering adults into the fields can be really short and quick in warm spring conditions, so they can really appear very quickly in a field, or they can occur in waves and, and have a really prolonged emergence if the spring is cool and wet. What you're going to be looking for are the adults, the egg masses on the underside of the leaves, and the larvae. The adults and the larvae will be quite uh, obvious, um, especially if the, if the numbers are high. And you need to look at the entire uh, plant. Early in the season, the adults and the egg ma masses tend to be concentrated on the border roads. That makes sense when you think about how the insect migrates into a field. And in these situations, spot treatments are often possible. The thresholds that we have for tomatoes in Ontario are 0.5 adult or 0.5 larvae per plant in the first two weeks after transplanting. Remember, the plant is very vulner vulnerable during this time. And after that, the plant can withstand a higher density of beetles. So it's one adult or one larva after that two weeks post-transplant. When you're scouting, make sure to indicate the life stage that you're seeing that is the, that is the predominant life stage, because this can affect the product choice that the grower chooses to, to use. Wireworms, and there are several species, are the larvae of click beetles, which is the family Elateridae. 
The adults of these insects are not typically pests, and I did talk about wireworms in the intro to entomology uh, presentation earlier. These insects will feed on the stems and the roots and the tubers of plants, and that can, reduce, that can actually kill the plant, or it can reduce its vigor or cause wilting. The click beetle larvae will also feed on crop residue. They are attracted to the carbon dioxide that these residues give off. The damage by wireworms is most severe during cool, wet springs when the growth of the plants is delayed. It just, it's, it's just the plant is smaller, it doesn't take as much feeding to actually kill it, but when the plant is well established, it can tolerate um, a higher, I guess, higher onslaught from insects in general. It can be these wireworms can be present in any soil type, but the most common injury is observed on coarse and sandy loam soils. The adults lay their eggs in small grains, sod, forage crops, or grassy fields, and problems are more likely for vegetable crops that are planted in these areas. With wireworms, they have an extended life cycle, with the larval stage lasting up to five years. So growers will often know uh, which fields have a lot of wireworms. And when you're, um, when you're working with them, you should try to get some information on crop history so that you can be prepared uh, to see certain uh, crops like, certain pests like wireworms. The common name of click beetle for this family, um, Elateridae, comes from the adults. They have a structure on their uh, body called a prosternal spine that works as a click mechanism. So if you were to take the adult and put it on its back, it would click this uh, structure and it would help to right the insect uh, so that it can go on its merry way. The adult uh, body is generally elongated and parallel sided. The larvae or wireworms are a dull brown or copper colored with a cylindrical hard body. They have three well-developed uh, legs, pairs of legs, and a well-developed head capsule. They can be variable in size from a few millimeters to over two centimeters or longer in length. They are often confused with millipedes. Um, millipedes, as you will perhaps recall, are not insects. Um, one of the things with them is they have lots of different legs. Insects, insects, of course, have three pairs of legs. Having an understanding of the crop history can be really helpful in terms of um, knowing whether wireworms might be an issue in the field. One of the things that can be done is uh, create bait, sta bait stations to help identify infested fields. And the basic premise here is that you're taking things like carrots or potatoes or mixtures of corn and wheat, and you're setting these out in bait stations, and you're checking every few days to see if there are wireworms, because the wireworms, especially early in the season or late in the season, will be hungry and they'll be looking for something to eat. If you're finding more than 0.5 or between, between 0.5 and one wireworm per station, it is indicative that wireworms might be a problem in that field. In, in the season, when you're actually out there scouting, what you're gonna be looking for are wilted plants and gaps. What you will need to do with wireworms because they are in the soil is to dig for them. So you're looking below ground, um, you can use a trowel to bring up some of that soil. And if you're seeing wireworms in those roots, um, what you need to do is, is record the percent injury and report that information to the grower. Sometimes wireworms will actually tunnel up stems, not all the way up into the plant, but you will see some tunneling. One of the things, too, is that the injury from wireworms can be confused with damping off of transplants, and that's another one of the reasons why you need to be actively digging and looking for them. There, have been, there has been some really interesting work done uh, by a researcher at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada out west. His name is um, Robert uh, Vernon, and um, he has worked on wireworm for, for decades. Um, he's worked with pheromones, uh, development of pheromones and testing of pheromones, as well as pheromone traps for them. So uh, these tools are available and they can help to assist in the identification of fields with wireworms in them.
I mentioned black cutworm is an early season uh, pest of, of uh, peppers and tomatoes, but there are other cutworm species that you will find on tomato in the season, later in the season, and these include variegated and dingy cutworm. I'll only be talking about the variegated cutworm in this presentation here. The larvae, uh, much like other cutworms, will feed at night. They are climbers, so they'll climb up into the plants to feed on both the foliage and the fruit. The feeding on leaves is typically that scattered, scattered pattern that you see in the picture down on the bottom uh, left of this screen here. But sometimes you'll just find that feeding along the margins. The fruit injury ranges from just uh, surface grazing to these deep holes. And once that fruit is injured, it isn't marketable. Also that feeding on the fruit will allow uh, spaces for microorganisms, secondary microorganisms to invade and cause that further fruit uh, breakdown. I have similar comments in terms of monitoring for variegated cutworm as I did for the um, black cutworm. Um, remember as well that it's really important to find these larvae early because they are easier to control that way. The threshold that we use for variegated cutworm in tomato is one larvae per 30 plant. In terms of identifying variegated cutworm, the larvae can be quite variable in color for kind of a gray appearance to, to brown, but they generally are quite mottled. They have a series of yellow spots along the middle of the dorsal side. The adults can be identified by these seven short marks along the costa of the wing. So if you look at the wing margin in that middle picture, you'll see these seven little tick marks along the edge of the wing. Um, that is a really, really distinctive feature of the adult. So the, the first four of those little ticks are, um, and the last two are in pairs. This insect overwinters in Ontario, but a large uh, portion of the population migrates from southerly regions, so much like black cutworm. The moths are, are usually detected in Ontario in July, and they're detected in pheromone traps. So that is later than the other species um, that, we, uh, that we have here. In addition to monitoring for larvae on plants, pheromone traps are also available for monitoring variegated cutworm adults. There are various trap designs available, including bucket, delta, and wing traps. These traps need to be installed by late June. In fields, they need to be put up on stakes at a height of approximately 1.5 meters and spaced at least 90 meters apart. They also need to be uh, away from any uh, hedgerows and things like that. These will indicate the presence of adult moths. It's important to be able to identify variegated cutworm uh, because there are sometimes other um, insects, other moths that will end up in these traps. So remember to look for those, mar uh, those marks along the margin of the wing. The threshold for variegated cutworm is seven moths per trap per week using wing or delta traps. Remember that trap design can actually affect thresh thresholds and so that this threshold is based on this type of trap, wing or delta. There is more information on crop IPM regarding using pheromone traps for monitoring this insect. Tomato fruitworm, which is also known as the corn earworm, can cause significant injury to tomato fruit. This insect is not listed in the calendar of Ontario tomato pests, so the information that I'm providing for you here should help you with your scouting. This insect has a wide host range, but corn and tomatoes are favored. It does not overwinter in Ontario. However, there has been a lot of work done to look at climate models under future climate change scenarios, and it does appear that it won't be long before this insect does successfully overwinter in Ontario. As it is now, the adult moths usually appear in mid to late July, sometimes earlier. Tomatoes are attractive egg-laying sites during the flowering period, especially if corn is not at an attractive stage, i.e. fresh silks present. The eggs are laid on the underside of leaves near the flowers or the fruit. The larvae of tomato fruitworm are quite variable in terms of color. They can be yellow, orange, green, or brown. The mature larvae will reach sizes up to four centimeters. They have a fine double stripe that is running down the length of the back. You can see a picture of this insect um, in the middle here feeding on tomato and see that the damage that it can cause is really quite extensive. The adults of this insect are buff or tanned colors and they have a wingspan of between three and a half to four centimeters. The forewing has a central brown dot that is clearly visible on the underside of the wing and it is faintly visible from the top. Tomato fruitworm is considered a minor pest of tomatoes in Ontario, but it can cause extensive fruit injury when it is present. What you need to do is inspect the fruit for signs of injury and for larvae that are feeding on that fruit. 
sometimes those larvae are feeding inside the fruit and you really have to kind of open it up to see what's going on. You'll often see a hole and frass that's present and that's obvious in the picture um, on the bottom left hand side of the screen here. In tomatoes, treatment is only necessary usually during flowering, as the females do not lay eggs in tomatoes after this stage. If your scouting indicates high numbers of eggs or larvae, an insecticide treatment may be warranted. There's a really great resource that you'll be able to find online. It's the Great Lakes and Maritime Pest Monitoring Network and um, tomato fruitworm is one of the pests that is monitored through this. So people essentially who participate in this network provide their data, uh, their trapping data for a number of different pests. And this information is available for people uh, to see and that can really uh, help to track how populations are doing in different regions at different times of the year. I really recommend that you take a look at it. There are several species of loopers that are found in tomatoes in Ontario. The most common of these is likely the cabbage looper. The larvae of cabbage looper are pale green in color with white stripes along each side of the body and two faint lines along the middle of the back. They have a distinctive looping motion. Larvae can grow up to four centimeters long. The pupae are a light green and they are encased in a loose cocoon that is found on the plant. The adults have a mottled grey appearance with a distinctive figure eight pattern on their forewings. This insect is not likely overwinter in Ontario. It usually appears mid-July, sometimes earlier. They do have a broad host range and you will definitely hear about them in some of the other training sessions that you attend. They're considered a minor pest of tomato, but they do chew irregular holes in the leaves. Monitoring for cabbage a looper is accomplished by looking at the plants. What you need to do is look at randomly, randomly choose 30 different plants in a field and look at the leaves for signs of damage and for frass. The threshold suggested for cabbage looper in Ontario is 15 larvae per 30 plants. Tomato plants can tolerate pretty extensive injury up to 25 defoliation by cabbage looper without a significant yield loss. There are other species of loopers that might be present, including soybean looper and tomato looper, but these are indistinguishable from one another. If you are scouting in tomatoes and peppers, you will occasionally encounter tomato and tobacco hornworms. These large caterpillars are up to eight centimeters long with a prominent spike or horn at the tip of the abdomen. They are usually green, but there are variations on the coloration. Tobacco hornworm has a white diagonally striped markings and a reddish horn. Tomato hornworm has V-shaped markings and a dark horn. It may also have a dark morph like the one that's shown in the middle picture here. Hornworms are considered minor pests in Ontario. They overwinter as pupae in the soil and the larvae emerge and are active mid to late summer. The larvae blend into the canopy really well. Remember, they're typically that green color. It's often very difficult to see them. Most of the time when I'm out looking for hornworms, I see piles of frass below the plant and the feeding injury long before I can actually find that insect that's feeding. The large larvae can consume entire leaves and they can leave the stems bare. They will also feed really extensively on that fruit. The threshold is one larvae per plant. European corn borer is a major pest of corn, but it has a wide host range that does include peppers. This insect is an internal feeder. Its presence at harvest or the presence of its injury renders the crop unmarketable. European corn borer overwinters in Ontario as a mature larva. The adults emerge in late May or early June. There are several ecotypes present in Ontario, univoltine, bivoltine, and multivoltine, which refers to the number of generations that are possible. In addition, European corn borer has multiple pheromone races. The presence of different races and different ecotypes presents challenges to monitoring of this insect. The larvae of European corn borer are smooth, light gray or tan with small dark spots on each body segment and a dark head capsule. They are up to 2.5 centimeters long. The adults are light brownish moths with patterns of wavy lines. In the picture on the left, there is a male and a female. The females have a thicker body and they are a yellowish buff color. 
The males have a thinner body and they are darker with tan to brown wings. One of the biggest problems with European corn borer as an internal feeder is that the injury can be really, really hard to detect. When the egg hatches, the larvae enters the fruit, usually um, at the stem cap under the calyx, sometimes at the side of the fruit. There is a yellow-brown sawdust-like residue or frass that can be apparent, although this can be washed off. When the larvae are, are feeding, they can cause really extensive injury within that fruit. In addition, fungi and bacteria can enter the hole and that can cause rot, which further exacerbates the problem. We usually see European corn borer larvae in pepper fruit mid-July through September. They typically will attack once the fruit are about the size of walnuts, about three centimeters in diameter. So these pictures on the left do show some of that injury that occurs inside the pepper, as well as those little bits of sawdust like frass that I mentioned um, previously. It's really easy to miss uh, injury caused by European corn borer larvae. Fortunately, we can use pheromone traps to track European corn borer activity, the activity of the moths. We used to recommend the use of the Iowa pheromone blend or the Z blend. However, changing population dynamics, probably associated to the extensive use of Bt corn, has resulted in um, some changes to our recommendations. We, we now feel that we need to monitor for European corn borer using Z, E, and possibly even um, hybrid strain pheromones. In terms of the use of traps, again, there is some discussion about what are the best traps to use. Traditionally, we have recommended the use of milk carton traps or sticky traps. However, Heliothis traps are probably much more accurate. They're also quite a lot more expensive. So if you are doing a monitoring program and you're trying to look at the different strains, it, the cost can add up really pretty quickly. Regardless, the traps are put up in, in grassy areas. The trap placement in the field and height is really important, and I, I don't go over the details here, but you can find that information on crop IBM. Remember, there's a zero tolerance for this insect in the fruit. There's also a European corn borer resistance survey that's been underway. Um, Jocelyn, Dr. Jocelyn Smith at the University of Guelph Ridgetown campus has been leading that, and her contact information um, has been provided here. Two-spotted spider mites are an indirect pest of tomatoes, but they can cause extensive injury in terms of fruit quality and yield. They are found in groups, often on the underside of leaves. So when you are looking at two-spotted spider mites, you'll often find the eggs, the immatures, and the adults. I say on the underside of leaves, but often when populations are high, you'll find them all over. Two-spotted spider mites produce dense webbing that coats the surface of the leaves. This helps to protect them from predators and it also protects them from some of the pest control products that we use. They are extremely small, less than 0.4 millimeters in size, and so they do require magnification for accurate counts. The adults are clear with two spots. They turn a reddish orange in response to cooler fall and winter temperatures. They have four pairs of legs in the nymphal and adult stage. So I have some pictures here of uh, the different life stages. There's the eggs, the eggs hatch, they become larvae, the larvae molt and they become uh, the nymphs. There are several nymph nymphal molts and then the individual will become either a male or a female. It's really important to recognize the injury caused by two-spotted spider mites. Having said that, if you're looking at a plant from a distance and you can see the injury, it means you probably missed the populations when they were lower. Two-spotted spider mite feeding causes a stippling look to the leaves. The leaves can become yellow or bronzed. High numbers can cause defoliation, which exposes the fruit to the sun and to birds, and it can reduce the holding ability of the plant. Two-spotted spider mite reproduce very quickly under hot and dry conditions. They can go from an egg to an adult in, in as little as a week, which means the populations increase very, very quickly. There are 10 to 15 overlapping generations possible, depending on the year. I mentioned that, again, the numbers can increase very, very quickly. They will disperse into and through the crop via a ballooning on a silk, or they can be moved through a crop and into a crop by people and equipment. It's very, very important when you're monitoring 
to check your clean fields first. And this doesn't just apply to two spot, but other insects and diseases. Go to your clean fields first. Go to the ones that you think might be problematic later. For two spotted spider mite, you're going to be looking for mites and webbing on the underside of older leaves. You can also use tapping trays or white sheets uh, to see if these mites are present. Basically, you put down a sheet or a tray and you, you tap the plant to see if spider mites uh, fall out. You're going to be looking for these slow moving dark specks. We don't really have any thresholds established in Ontario. For two spotted spider mite, there's actually a survey underway to look at resistance in this pest and it's being run by a, a group at Western University. If you're interested in finding out more, please feel free to contact uh, one of us at OMAFTA. Over the last few years, we've had increasing reports of stink bug injury in tomatoes and peppers. There are multiple species that are present in Ontario, and some of the more common ones that we'll find in tomato and pepper crops include the brown stink bug, the one spotted stink bug, and the green stink bug. One of the others I wanted to draw your attention to is the brown marmorated stink bug, which is a new invasive stink bug species that's been found in Ontario. Although I haven't actually found it in tomato and pepper, it does attack those crops and it is present in the regions that we grow them. So it's one that you need to be aware of and on the lookout for. Stink bugs are shield shaped insects. The adults overwinter as adults and there is one generation per year in Ontario. Stink bugs develop through egg, nymphs, and adults. The nymphs look similar to the adults, but they don't have wings. They don't really have that really strong shield shape look to them, but you can see that it's developing in these, um, in these nymphs here. You'll also see the little wing pads that start to form as the nymphs grow. So these are just some examples of the nymphal, in, nymphal instars from the adults that I showed on the previous slide. Stink bugs have piercing, sucking mouth parts. It's basically, it's, it's like they have a little syringe that they poke into the fruit when they're feeding. On pepper, the feeding damage under the skin will appear white. It's quite faint on the exterior. On tomato, the damage varies depending on whether the feeding occurred when the fruit were green or red. Feeding on red fruit produces cloud spots. When the peel is removed, these spots are larger and they appear white. On green fruit, feeding will look like yellow snowflakes, and it's quite visible, but that the white spots under the peel are less apparent. The spots under the peel are a quality issue for the processing tomato in, uh, industry. One of the other things too with uh, fruit that is affected by stink bug feeding is that the tissues under the skin are, it's kind of corky, um, and you may be able to, to feel that it actually has a different uh, texture. In addition to feeding on the fruit, stink bugs may also feed on the vegetative tissues. And of course, because of the nature of the feeding, secondary infections are possible. We don't really have a, a great um, monitoring program for stink bugs. I, I find it's a bit of a, a moving target here. Um, there's been some recent state uh, work done by Celeste Welty at Ohio State University, and these are the recommendations that I'm making here. Stink bugs are typically active between uh, July and harvest um, in tomato and pepper crops. They tend to be active when it's warmer. Stink bugs do have multiple hosts. They're, they're polyphagous um, and they do of course have preference, preferences, but they move around through the season. They will often move from weedy areas um, into or other crops into tomatoes and peppers. It is not easy to scout for stink bugs. Um, they require intensive scouting. You should be looking at at least 40 different locations per field. The way to monitor for them in tomatoes and peppers are using uh, beading trays or sheets. So basically you would put those underneath the plant and you would shake the plant to see if there's stink bugs in them. You're also going to be looking at fruit, uh, about 10 fruit per location. Uh, to see if there's any injury. So you can see that each time you're going, you're actually looking at quite a lot of fruit. And it's best to scout for them either early in the morning or in the evening. Scouting tends to underestimate damage. Um, the threshold is quite low. So if it's between 0.5 and 1%, you've reached your threshold. And you think about that as an example, 
0.75% is three of those 400 fruit that you're looking at. So very low tolerance for stink bug injury. And part of that is because we have such a limited availability of effective controls. So that's, that's, those are the recommendations for monitoring stink bugs. And I don't think we have that on crop IPM. Tarnished plant bugs is another pest to be aware of for tomatoes and peppers. Tarnished plant bug, if you've taken, or will, if you are taking other um, training courses for the different commodities, you're gonna hear about tarnished plant bug again. This is an insect, again, with piercing, sucking mouth parts, but it's um, sort of like stink bugs, but much, much smaller. The adults are five to six millimeters in size. They're a kind of a shiny um, yellow to brown uh, black appearance with a distinctive Y on that triangular area uh, between the wings. It's called the scutellum. You can see that on the picture on the right. The nymphs are greenish with black spots. As these nymphs grow, they start to develop wing, pad, wing pads. They are sometimes confused with aphids, but they do move a lot faster and they don't have uh, cornicles that aphids do have. And there are five nymphal instars. They have a very wide range of, of plants that they will feed on, including a lot of wild hosts, weeds, and cultivated crops. They're commonly found on members of the mint family, chickweed, pigweed, and alfalfa. They overwinter as adults in debris and they're active early in the season. And again, they're highly, they're highly mobile. Tarnished plant bug is not usually a problem in tomatoes because it has quite a low preference for their fruit. It can cause injury in peppers, including damage to the blossoms. The feeding will result in flower drop. And when they feed on pepper fruit, they will cause indentations or holes and corky flesh. That corky flesh might be confused with stink bug injury, except, except that it's usually much less extensive. Remember, this is an, a mobile insect. It will move into fields when surrounding vegetation dries up or after a nearby cereal or forage crop is harvested. In peppers, you're gonna be looking for nymphs by shaking the foliage onto light colored tapping trays. So if you're monitoring for stink bugs, you will likely see um, tarnished plant bug as well. I didn't have a great picture of that. So I've thrown in a picture of monitoring for tarnished plant bug in strawberries. You can see the person who's monitoring is using a colored um, pan. She is shaking um, the strawberries uh, to look for tarnished plant bugs. And you're also going to be inspecting the fruit for damage. And um, with tarnished plant bug, are really there are no established thresholds. So I mentioned that um, Tarnished plant bug nymphs are sometimes confused with aphids. There are several species of aphids in Ontario, including green peach, tomato, and melon aphids. And these all have a wide range of summer hosts. They will typically overwinter as eggs on woody plants and shrubs. Aphids have both sexual and asexual reproduction. And so this, the numbers can increase really rapidly in season if conditions are good for them. There are multiple generations per year. Aphids have a teardrop shape with two cornicles at the tip of the abdomen, sometimes referred to as tailpipes. The adults can be winged or they can be wingless. The nymphs look very similar to the adults, but they are smaller. Aphids are found in colonies on the underside of leaves or along the stems where new growth is apparent. Aphids have piercing sucking mouth parts. They will suck the plant sap, causing leaf distortion. Aphids are primary vectors of several economically significant viral diseases. They spread the virus as they feed. Cucumber mosaic virus is the most common and it is spread in a non-persistent manner. In terms of sampling for aphids, plan to look at 10 groups of 10 plants across the field. Inspect the underside of plants from the top, middle and bottom of the plants. If you are seeing extensive signs of honeydew and sooty mold on the fruit and the foliage and it is contaminating the crop, treatment might be warranted. We don't have any uh, thresholds for aphids um, in Ontario. Don't forget to look for beneficial organisms as well. There are lots of things that like to feed on aphids and that will parasitize aphids. The picture on the bottom left shows a, an aphid that has been parasitized by a wasp. It, it has taken on quite a, a kind of a paper mache like look, which is characteristic of uh, parasitism by wasps. The pepper maggot is a member of the family Tephritidae or fruit flies. This group of insects will typically attack the fruits of their hosts just as these are beginning to ripen. 
Pepper maggot is a specialist on pepper. It is an uncommon problem in Ontario that is limited to Essex County. They overwinter as pupae in the soil and there is one generation per year. The female lays her eggs in pepper fruit. The maggots feed internally on the placenta or the fruit wall. Eventually they reach lengths of up to 12 millimeters. Usually you will only find one larvae per fruit. They may be confused with European corn borer or pepper weevil larvae. However, pepper maggots lack a distinct head capsule. Instead, what you will find at one tapered end are two black mouth hooks. Control needs to occur prior to oviposition. Once the female has laid her eggs, that fruit will become infested. So it's really important to apply controls prior to this time. The adults are monitored using yellow sticky traps that are baited with vials of ammonia. These traps are hung near the field, preferably in trees, at, at heights of up to 8.5 meters. Fewer flies are captured with traps at lower heights. This may be impractical from a field standpoint, scouting standpoint. There is no tolerance in processing or fresh market peppers. If you look at the pepper down on the left hand side, what you will see are some oviposition scars. So the one on the sort of bottom right of that picture is darkened and that's a that's a scar from pepper maggot uh, oviposition. And, um, and on the left hand side of that picture, what you'll see is a is a dimple with a larger hole and that's actually an exit hole. So once the pepper maggot has uh, reached maturity, it will chew its way out of the fruit and pupate um, outside of that fruit. I'm not going to spend much time talking about thrips. There is some information that is included in Prop IPM. One of the things that's really important with these little insects is that in addition to feeding injury, they are also vectors of tomato wilt spot virus. They occur in tomatoes between June and September after transplanting and all the way to harvest, but especially during and after flowering. Thrips do like flowers and this is one of the places that you will find them. On the picture below, I have a, um, an illustration of the life cycle of a thrips. It starts as an egg. The females lay those eggs inside uh, the leaf tissue. Um, when those eggs hatch, they create that injury that you see here. They will also feed on the tomato fruit and um, they the injury that you can see on those the fruit, those halos or sort of pansy spots are typical of uh, thrips injury. We don't have any good thresholds for thrips, um, but again, these are um, these can be very important vectors of tomato spotted wilt virus in addition to the feeding damage that they cause. Flea beetles are another pest that I'm not gonna spend very much time covering, you will probably hear about flea beetles in some of the other sessions that you attend. Um, the species that are most commonly found in these crops here are potato flea beetle and the pale striped flea beetle. Flea beetles um, have their name because they, the, their hind legs are very well adapted to jumping and they will really jump off plants when they see you coming. This makes them somewhat uh, challenging to, uh, to scout for because it's again with flea beetles it's a numbers game. They cause the most injury to plants when they're small. So larger plants tend to be able to, uh, to grow quickly and the injury isn't is significant on the plant. So for plants that are less than about uh, 20 centimeters or eight inches tall, um, the threshold is um, more than four beetles for every 30 plants. And the last insect that I wanted to cover today, uh, and again, very briefly, and it's more for recognition purposes, are sap beetles, or sometimes referred to as picnic beetles. These are found in damaged, overripe, and rotting fruit typically. So usually when you see them, it, there's another problem that's occurring on the crop, and you'll often find them in the fruit that has already dropped. Um, so uh, this, is, this is what they look like, the adults. You may also see the, the larvae. Um, and here, this is kind of an interesting um, picture on the left-hand side um, of uh, the larvae because you can see that there's um, there's a friend that's on top of that uh, larva, um, and it's actually a, glo a globular springtail. Um, so with this, I'm going to end my presentation, and thank you for attending. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at the email below.